Good morning all, uh, I'm Miguel Acosta. I'm the Education Media Fellow, I'm just presenting ENT Emergency Pearls, Pitfalls, Tips and Tricks. Hope you enjoy your time here at West Med. Um, I'm around if you need any help, uh, so please approach me and we can discuss any topics you would like to discuss. This presentation will have a link below, I realise that some of the text might be a little small, so please just find the link below and you can follow it with your own copy. So just a few general points. Welcome to the West Mid ED department. Uh, we're here to help, but please ask for advice. Um, literature is easily accessible. So I think if you are unsure of a topic, there are many literature sources available online and free to our department. So use them and uh, get comfortable accessing them. Um, consult local protocol or NICE guidelines, so you're probably sick of me saying look at NICE guidelines, I mention it all my talks, but it's a good source and uh, get comfortable using it. Um, I've highlighted this in red, explore our intranet, so look for guidelines or protocols, they're not always easy to find and they not be, may not be where you expect them to be, um, so just have a little browse through um, different parts of our intranet and you, you should be able to find um, most common um, protocols and uh, information that will help you. Um, so, any ENT emergencies, um, discuss with ENT early if you have any concern. Um, they're a nice team and will help you out. Um, I'm just going to discuss a few ENT emergencies briefly and hopefully this will help your management. So in this slide, um, I've just highlighted exploring the internet. So this is the Charleston and Westminster Hospital Trust Internet. And you can see this little search bar in the top right hand corner. Type in a topic there and you will find what you're looking for. Um, I realize this is very small, but um, the website is self-explanatory and will give you good insight. So, there's another site showing the policies and guidelines. Click on that and show you often the, the most common guidelines always placed first. Um, but there's also a search bar that you can find common policies and guidelines. So epistaxis, so quite commonly seen in our department. Um, so there's an ENT trolley in Major C, which contains all the basic equipment. So go to Major C. It's in cubicle, I think it's in cubicle 23 or 24. Um, go have a look at what's in the cubic, what's in the, in the trolley and see what's available to use. Um, if you know what equipment we have, it'll make your life a lot easier uh, as opposed to running around the department looking for things. Um, so become familiar with what's, what is available. Um, another important thing is personal protective equipment. So always protect yourself. There are aprons, there are gloves. Um, if you need a mask, it is available. Masks and goggles, they are available. Uh, if you're not sure where they are, just ask, uh, but get used to protecting yourself. Um, so simple management, so always apply pressure first. If you have more than two failures or unable to stop a bleed, um, the Rapid Rhino works well and is easy to use. So there's a little image of a Rapid Rhino if you've never used one. Um, read up about them and uh, very simple to use and very effective to use. Uh, another point to know is understand your limitations. So if a patient is bleeding a lot and you don't know how to stop it, call or get assistance early on. Um, so call a senior out in our department and also call ENT to assist. Um, just uh, three points I want to highlight. And that is antibiotic, antibiotics for epistaxis. So not all patients need antibiotics. Um, actually, most patients don't need antibiotics. Only the immunocompromised, um, or those that, those that will have prolonged packing. So normally longer than 72 hours will require antibiotics. And then um, packing should be left in at least 48 to 72 hours in patients that are uh, super therapeutic on anticoagulants. Uh, my second point is elevated blood pressure and epistaxis. So 
Elevated blood pressure does not cause epistaxis. Uh, blood pressure is often a result, high blood pressure is often a result of pain and anxiety. Um, so you don't need to control the blood pressure as such or per se. Give adequate analgesia and uh, stop the nosebleed and hopefully the, the blood pressure will settle. And then posterior epistaxis. So this is important to know. Um, in elderly patients um, who present with brisk bleeds um, that cannot be directly visualized and often ongoing bleeds um, despite bilateral anterior packing, always think of posterior epistaxis. Um, and speak to ENT early, they require aggressive treatment uh, in a monitored setting and may require blood uh, blood products and uh, further investigation. So every time you have um, elderly patients with um, quite severe nosebleeds, have a high suspicion of a posterior bleed. My next topic is ear foreign bodies. Um, so my first point there is call ENT, don't go digging around. We can see a little insect in someone's ear in the external auditory canal and it's wedged quite well in there. Don't go digging around, you may cause further damage. Um, if something is superficial and you can, um, you can fish it out, you can try. But if you're unsure or if something is wedged in there, um, don't go exploring. Uh, but just a few tips for ear, and for ear foreign body removal. So use a pediatric nasal speculum to see. Try irrigate to remove. Um, try irrigation to remove. So non wedged objects which aren't likely to expand when wet. So that's important. So seeds, um, impacted objects, refer straight to ENT. Um, you don't want to those objects to expand and impact further and get lodged in there. Um, Two percent lidocaine works well. Um, it kills insects before removal and it also works very well for analgesia. So recommended tools. Um, so an owl hook is commonly used an owl hook is commonly used for beads and round objects. Um, and a suction tip catheter works really well in certain circumstances. There are a few tips there. So uh, tissue adhesive, so often applied to a, a cotton swab and then stuck on the object and left there for a few seconds and then the foreign object can get removed. Um, works really well. Um, also, always double check um, after removing objects that nothing has been left behind. Um, just because you removed one object doesn't mean that there aren't any other foreign objects. So always check both nostrils and both ears when you're done. Um, refer all button batteries and magnets early and also chronic impacted or penetrating foreign bodies and objects that may swell such as beans, corn, seeds. Um, they should be seen urgently by ENT. Nasal foreign bodies. Um, good pointers. First try positive pressure so you can use a, the puff from a bag valve mask. Um, over the mouth with um, opposite near occluded. So basically push pressure on the one um, nostril bag valve and the pressure can expel the foreign object. Um, and to reduce the swelling, you can apply a one-to-one -one mix of um, lidocaine and oxymetazolin. Um, there's also the similar precautions applied to nasal foreign body. Um, if you see a foreign body that, we, that is wedged in the nose, call ENT early. Malignant otitis externa. Um, so I suspect malignant otitis externa in patients who are immunocompromised uh, or, or diabetic with ear pain. Um, so this can progress to meningitis, encephalitis, brain abscess, and cavernous venous thrombosis. So the, the challenge is to catch this early. Um, so be suspicious of patients who present um, with pain out of proportion to their clinical findings. Um, they can also have ear pain, trismus or jaw pain. So inspect the auditory canal and look for white pink granulation tissue where cartilage and bone meet. Um, if you have a low pretest 
probability, just order an ESR. Um, if you have a high pretest probability, just refer straight to ENT. Sudden sensorineural hearing loss. Um, so this is referred to the bowel's pause of the ear and it's a diagnosis of exclusion um, in which unilateral hearing loss occurs over hours or overnight. Patients may present vertigo and one third may have permanent hearing loss. Um, so always carefully examine the cranial nerves and elicit a history of trauma, infection or pain. Look for signs of infection and uh, look for any ear canal obstruction. Um, I've highlighted this in red, but be suspicious for posterior circulating stroke. If you have a diagnosis of um, bowel's pause of the ear, treatment steroids, so it's one milligram per kg of prednisolone for 10 days, and then antivirals. Um, they need to be referred to ENT for imaging and audiometric testing. Um, discuss all these patients with ENT. And take a message, always exclude a stroke. Epiglottitis, um, so I mean, if you've seen one of these, you will remember it and it'll always be clean your head. Uh, but if you haven't, have a high index of suspicion, it can catch you out. So in patients with a fever and sore throat, with a normal appearing pharynx, uh, think epiglottitis. Um, so they can present with strider and tripoding, uh, and this may be clues of impending obstruction which can occur suddenly. Um, so there are two images and you can see a swollen flamed epiglottis. Um, important involve ENT and, and anesthetics early because you can lose your airway. Um, imaging, so there's an x-ray showing the thumbprint sign um, but a DD visualization by fiber optic nasal uh, pharyngoscopy is ideal. Antibiotics are treated early with IV kef um, or kefotaxime plus vancomycin if septic. Pharyngitis, so this is very common in children. Um, I think I'm not going to go through everything, but basically only 10% of pharyngitis is caused by strep. So there's little evidence that treating strep throat prevents glomerulonephritis, peritonsal abscess or rheumatic fever. Um, the Toronto throat score, which is a modified central score, is used. Um, I have graded or put the different Toronto uh, throat scores there and appropriate management. But I guess the basic take, take home message is that not everyone requires antibiotics. So don't just see sore throat or tonsillitis and give antibiotics. Um, go through literature um, and use information at hand. Um, if a patient requires antibiotics, consult our antibiotic guidelines, but oral pen penicillin is antibiotic of choice. Um, don't forget NSAIDs, paracetamol and lozenges, which help relieve pain. And uh, not enough evidence supports steroid use. Uh, peritonsal abscess, another topic. Um, so this is when to suspect how to drain it. So patients who present with a sore throat, the trismus, hot potato voice, um, and an asymmetric um, uvula, or asymmetric tonsils and uvular deviation, suspect peritonsal abscess. Um, point of care ultrasound um, is quite effective at uh, having a definitive diagnosis or using CT scan. Uh, refer to ENT or get a, a senior to assist in draining um, a peritonsal abscess. And angioedema, I think this is also something really important that we should be aware of. So um, hereditary or acquired angioedema from ACE inhibitors um, cause localized or diffuse soft tissue swelling uh, and can cause airway compromise. So here we can see actually a young lady uh, with a very swollen face and um, it's quite a dramatic presentation. Often it can just be a swollen lip and often they might not have any external findings but the oropharynx and the airway can be obstructed, so um, don't, don't brush someone aside who's complaining of um, feeling that the airway is being obstructed and even though they look normal from the outside. Um, so always take a family allergy and medication history. Um, some patients present with isolated severe abdominal pain and uh, free fluid and imaging. 
and that can be the only finding. ACE inhibitor uh, angioedema can occur in patients even if they've been taking ACE inhibitors for years. So a patient can have no change in the medication and now they present angioedema. Um, always examine the airway carefully and if they have any suspicious signs, call ENT and anesthetics early. I think that's for all of these cases, ENT cases, if you have any suspicion of airway compromise, speak to anesthetics early. You don't want to lose the airway. Um, the treatment is adre adrenaline IM 0.5 milligrams, 1 in 1000 solution, and um, that's often given in the right thigh. And that's the end of my presentation.